my government, the Department of Justice, put me in jail, and my government, the Internal Revenue Service, paid me the largest award in U.S. history. As a manager at Switzerland's largest bank, UBS, Bradley Birkenfeld found himself part of a massive, long-standing scheme to help wealthy Americans evade taxes. There were 19,000 offshore illegal accounts with $20 billion in assets. Of Americans? Only of Americans. This was the American desk, and it was based out of Lugano, Geneva, and Zurich. In 2007, he decided to blow the whistle, the first banker ever to break open the legendary Swiss bank secrecy. They didn't find me. I sought out the DOJ, the IRS, the SEC, and the U.S. Senate back in 2007. And the problem here is, is that when I gave them this information, they were hostile towards me at the DOJ from day one. Birkenfeld suspects hostility from DOJ, the Department of Justice, had something to do with UBS's powerful connections. The bank was a top donor to then-President George W. Bush. They had over a trillion dollars in assets. So you can imagine they had offices worldwide, they had a lot of political influence, and they hired politicians to help them. It turns out DOJ was interested in prosecuting Birkenfeld in the tax scheme. They used evidence he provided to build a case against him. You did serve time. Oh, I did. Yes, I did serve time. While he, the whistleblower, was prosecuted, the government worked behind closed doors to cut a deal with his former employer, UBS, which was one of President Obama's top donors. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton took the lead in negotiations with the Swiss foreign minister. Do you think it was unusual that the Secretary of State at the time, Hillary Clinton, intervened in this giant criminal case? She has no right in getting involved in an international criminal investigation. And then, in July 2009... There has been an agreement reached... Uh, the bank agreed to pay a settlement of $780 million. Birkenfeld calls it a sweetheart deal for UBS, because it was about a billion less than the profit UBS made from the illegal accounts. What's more, UBS would only have to give up 4,450 tax evaders out of 19,000. There was no explanation as to who decided which names were divulged and which ones got conveniently buried. Why wouldn't you get all of the names? In essence, the secrecy has been allowed to continue instead of being stopped. Well, that's precisely it. It's a continuation of Swiss bank secrecy, American style. This was not a real investigation. This was to cover up for the rich and powerful people in this country, the millionaires and billionaires and politicians who had accounts in Switzerland. There's one final twist to the story. Whistleblowers are entitled to up to 30 percent of the money collected from tax evaders. With Birkenfeld's evidence, the IRS was able to recoup $5 billion. One month after he got out of prison, he got the largest IRS award ever. How much money? It was $104 million. Punished as a villain, yet rewarded as a hero. He says Americans have good reason to wonder what powerful names are among the thousands kept secret in the UBS deal. We were well aware of many people that had accounts at UBS that were given to uh, political parties. That was a fact. But yet, because it was a numbered account in Switzerland, no one ever thought they'd be exposed. So that's very, very uh, dangerous and something that they don't want to have come out. Was it worth it to you to expose the practices that you did to get the $100 million plus, but also to spend years in prison? I think I did it out of, uh, out of courage and doing the right thing for my country. And I think people see that. And certainly I did go to prison for two and a half years, but the vindication of getting the $104 million really makes me smile because what it does is sends a message to the DOJ, I beat the system and I beat you. And now the American people can decide who is right and who is wrong. Working fires like this one in New Mexico, Dabney was prepared for life or death situations. But she was unprepared for the hostility she faced back at the station in California's Region 5, covering 20 million acres in the Pacific Southwest. There was three females, and then within a month, one had quit. And then within two or three months, one was ran out for filing a sexual harassment claim. And then pretty soon, it was only me. So then it, they you know, started torturing me. 
this frat boy attitude and the bullying and being humiliated, being called fat, also being called a whore, and it just drove me up the wall. I couldn't take it. Do you think they were trying to be playful when they would call you these names? No, it's, it's part of the culture. Dabney didn't know it then, but Region 5, the Forest Service, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture all had sordid histories of civil rights violations and discrimination dating back decades. Corrective actions ordered over the years didn't prevent Dabney from getting singled out, she says, as a Mexican Native American and a woman. One of my captains was forcing me to tell him when I started my menstrual periods. How did you report this? What did you do? Every month when I would start my menstrual cycle, I would go in there and I would cover my face with my hands and just say, you know, I started my period and be humiliated. Why do you think he was doing that? I don't know his motives other than I just think he's sick, to be honest. In early 2011, Dabney attended a firefighter training conference where phone numbers were given out on a list. In the middle of the night, I get a phone call. She saved the recorded message. Alicia, it's me, sweetie. I'm leaving, girl. My is half stacked. I'm ready to go. I'm in uh, room uh, 203. I'm, I'm, I'm totally ready to hang out, baby girl. Just give me a call back. I hope you're all wet like I am, baby girl. You could hear a ton of guys laughing in the background. So it's some type of ha ha ha, I don't know. It's not like this guy liked me and wanted to hang out with me. He was trying to humiliate me, of course. When you hear Alicia Dabney's story, what's your take on her case? The management infrastructure of USDA is such is that it encourages this kind of frat boy, um, this atmosphere. Michael McRae experienced the culture at USDA, the US Department of Agriculture, firsthand. A manager there in the 90s, he exposed fraud worth millions of tax dollars in a program for poor communities. Forged checks, some really outrageous stuff that we wound up going to the OIG, um, the Inspector General, and we even notified the um, President's Initiative on Race, trying to get him some help. Instead of help, McRae says he got targeted for being a minority who also blew the whistle and lost his job. In 1995, he began filing a series of discrimination and retaliation claims, which by law must be investigated within six months. What was the outcome of your complaints? My complaints have never been fought, processed to completion. From 1990s? From 1990s. I had testimony, corroboration, documentation. I had a case that shouldn't have taken 20 minutes. That has, been t that has taken 20 years. How big is this problem of long-standing backlogs on civil rights complaints? It's huge, it's, it's tremendous. Just a few months later came what Dabney says was her lowest point with the Forest Service. In August of 2011, she was attending a training conference when she says a supervisor asked to borrow some work supplies at the hotel. So I knock on the door and he opens it and he just grabs me in a chokehold and then flings me on the bed. And I'm literally just scared. I, I didn't know what he was doing. And I, he starts to say, Alicia, let's just cuddle. Let, you know, let's hang out. Let's be together. And I was like, I don't, no, you're my boss. Please don't do this right now. And he just kept getting tighter and tighter. And I just you know, started saying, please, like, please don't do this to me right now. And so I had to talk him down, reminding him, like, you're my boss. You don't want to do this to me right now. Please let go of me. And so when I started crying, then he finally, you know, let go of me. She says she reported the incident to her supervisor and multiple investigative bodies, but suffered more reprisal. McCray, who is an attorney, has filed a class action suit on behalf of the 3,000 people whose discrimination claims remained unprocessed in 2009. There's no accountability, even, even in cases where, you know, discrimination has been, been proven. If you're a manager, you don't even have to pay for your defense because it's going to be the agency's attorneys are going to, you know, they're going to be your attorneys. And if there are any fines? The Justice Department pays. Well, taxpayers pay. Well, absolutely. But so from the, from the manager's point of view, it's no, there's, there's no cost to them. There's zero accountability. As for Dabney, the Department of Agriculture admitted no fault, but paid her a confidential settlement that included the alleged hotel assault with the condition she never worked there again. I don't know how to get justice other than letting 
letting America know, letting people know, you know, like this has happened to me, but it doesn't have to continue to happen to others.